Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me as my guest, Dr. Justin Paquette. Dr. Paquette is a neurosurgeon who practices complex spine surgery in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Paquette did his medical training at Albany Medical College. He then went on to complete a residency in neurosurgery at the Harvard Tufts Combined Program in Boston, Massachusetts. From there, he completed a fellowship in complex spine surgery in Los Angeles at Cedar sinai Good afternoon, Dr. Paquette. Good afternoon. Dr. Paquette, today I would like to talk about a little different uh, approach to uh, a fairly common problem called cervical radiculopathy. I think most of us uh, are familiar with uh, what I would consider an anterior approach to dealing with uh, arm pain coming from the neck uh, with an anterior cervical discectomy and a fusion. When do you choose to consider going through the back of the neck and just doing a minimally invasive procedure to take the pressure off a nerve root for a cervical radiculopathy? Sure. So a posterior cervical frame anatomy is a really great procedure. It's a non-fusion procedure. It's best utilized um, when the patient's primary symptoms are related to the nerve being pinched. In other words, if they have severe amounts of neck pain from very degenerated uh, discs and joints and uh, uh, instability of the spine, probably not the best patient to do this on. But in an individual who has a relatively normal appearing neck, discs are in pretty good position, um, but there's either a bone spur or a uh, herniated disc that's pressing up against the nerve, we can actually do a very nice job on t uh, decompressing that nerve from the back. And what it involves is making a centimeter and a half incision in the midline of the back, and then using a microscope or a, a little um, tube dilator to go down to that particular level. Once we get down to that level we, and we confirm that upon um, fluoroscopic uh, shots, we then uh, drill a small little window into the back of the spine. And the key thing is here is while we're doing that, we try to leave as much of the normal anatomy as possible. The joints, the bones, the muscles, the ligaments, leave all of that intact. Go in there, make the little window, and under that window, we're going to see the nerve as it exits the spine, and right underneath it is going to be the disc herniation or the bone spur. And then using a variety of special micro instruments, we can then basically uh, chisel down the bone spur, resect the arthritis, take out the, uh, the, the uh, herniated disc, and decompress the nerve. So this is more like what, what you would typically think of doing for a herniated disc in the low back, coming in from the back and just moving the nerve out of the way and taking whatever disc material is herniated out and, and making sure that nerve has enough breathing room, so to speak. Yeah, exactly right. Just the only difference in being the neck. And, and <coughs> I, think, I think I'm more used to hearing people talk about anterior cervical discectomy and fusion as, as a a treatment option for uh, cervical radiculopathy. How often do you think it's appropriate, or, or in your practice, how many times do you choose to go through the back versus doing an anterior mm -hmm. cervical discectomy? Is this uncommon? I would say it's, um, it's certainly uncommon in general practice. I would say that in my personal hands, if, um, if you see one individual who could go either way, I would prefer to go uh, with the non-fusion posterior, um, uh, uh, posterior frame anatomy. Probably that, rec that represents about 25% of individuals that have uh, cervical problems. So it's much more common in your practice to actually see patients that are more appropriate for that anterior procedure. They, they have other problems that really require a fusion in addition to just making sure the nerves are breathing freely. Right. They'll have even more advanced uh, changes in the disc or a slip in the disc or some other thing that um, requires a more, uh, as you say, uh, advanced intervention. Okay. Um, let's define some terms for the listener. Uh, we, we've thrown this term around called cervical radiculopathy versus, let's say, just neck pain. What is a cervical radiculopathy? So cervical radiculopathy literally is um, a nerve being pinched. It's a pinched nerve in the neck. And as the nerves leave the spine, they leave through special little nerve tunnels. And those nerve tunnels are bounded by a variety of different objects, the uh, bones above and below, the joint in back, and the disc in front. If you develop pathology with any of those structures, that nerve tunnel can get narrowed down and pinch off the nerve. And that's a cervical radiculopathy. Now, the symptoms that a patient can experience, though, can be different. But usually it's uh, pain first, then numbness, and then ultimately weakness, all in the distribution of where that nerve goes. 
And, and <coughs> when, when you see a patient in your office, what test do you use to make a decision about whether this person is uh, uh, more appropriate for an anterior procedure or more appropriate for a posterior procedure? In the office, uh, probably the most important test is going to be the clinical history uh, because I want to know how much of their pain system or, or pain symptoms are the neck and how much is it coming from the arm. As long as their uh, neck pain symptoms are not significant, then I think that that individual could potentially be approached through a posterior uh, foramenotomy. If, however, they have really severe neck pain, limited range of motion of the neck, um, and x-rays would show a slip or some kind of a really degenerated disc or joint, that probably is not going to, person is not to do, do so well with a foramenotomy because uh, their neck pain will remain unchanged after surgery. So that person that you just described has two problems. They have the pinched nerves, but the pinched nerve is more because of the segmental instability at that segment. You're more worried about that. Correct. And you're trying to fix that. And I think in, in some earlier discussions we had, uh, the whole concept came up of can you treat neck pain, axial neck pain, with a fusion procedure? And as my, my understanding is, is that that's somewhat 50-50 uh, um, proposition. Maybe, maybe not. Agreed, yeah. I think that if it's somebody who just has pure axial neck pain without any obvious uh, real problem in their neck, you know, no fractures, no tumors, no major uh, slippages, that person should definitely be tra with, treated with long-term conservative therapy, with medications, ther uh, physical therapy, et cetera. Now, would you ever, if you saw a person like that who had, you know, relatively good disc, some neck pain, I mean substantial neck pain, and they still had a cervical radiculopathy, would you offer them a, pers a posterior procedure and say, this is only going to help your arm pain, I can't help your neck pain with this? Mm -hmm. Or would you just basically go and do an anterior procedure and sort of bet on that 50-50 chance that you'll impact their neck pain? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd have to have a long discussion with that patient because it really would be on a person-to-person um, uh, -person basis. I'd have to see really how much was their neck pain, uh, was it really bothering them or was it more than the arm pain that's bothering them? Uh, and I also want to look at their images to see if those discs looked really bad or not that bad. If I thought that I could get away with it, meaning to get their neck pain better, their arm pain better, and maybe improve their neck pain a little bit, I would do a posterior. But if they had a very poorly degenerated spine at the level we were talking about, I would tell them probably, you know, it's in your best interest just to get it fused. Okay. Um, let's look at the procedure itself. I mean, is, is when you comp com compare this, uh, to the anterior procedure. The anterior procedure is a, is a one-hour procedure. It's an outpatient procedure. People get over this fairly rapidly. Mm -hmm. What about the posterior procedure? Is it as innocuous? Uh, is it a one-hour procedure, outpatient procedure, or does it take you longer to do the posterior sure. procedure? So the, um, the procedure itself probably takes about the same time, about an hour. It's done through an incision that's about a centimeter and a half. Uh, we use the microscope and we use the fluoroscope to make sure that we go to the right spot. It's probably a bit more painful for patients only because we have to go um, in and around the muscles of the back of the neck. And those muscles are very small and very sensitive, and when they spasm up, it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that in general, the recovery process is a little bit more uncomfortable for posterior cervicals. Once they've healed, they're both basically on the same, the same situation. The advantage is, is that when you do the posterior cervical, you don't have to um, avoid anti-inflammatories as you do with the anterior cervical and fusion. Since we're not trying to fuse from the back, we can use anti-inflammatories or any other me medications we want to to try to help to control the pain. Let's look at the, at the, at the potential uh, healing time for a posterior procedure. It, it sounds to me like, um, even though it may in the early stages be a little bit more painful because of the spasms, you've really done far less surgery. Yet you don't have a metal plate in, you haven't done a procedure, that requires a fusion. You don't have to wait for the fusion. I would assume, based on what you've just described, that a person who has a posterior foramenotomy, once they get over that spasm, is pretty much good to go. That they don't have the restrictions that a person with an anterior fusion is. Is that accurate? Or, or? yeah, that's pretty accurate. Uh, they're going to find that their arm symptoms will respond very quickly. So arm pain gets better, uh, oftentimes before they even leave the hospital. Uh, the uh, sp the spasms will be there for a few weeks. They can certainly drive within a week, though, and probably get back to work within uh, a couple of weeks. Um, 
and uh, physical therapy, as with all my patients, six, six weeks after surgery. But I do agree that at some point, once those muscle spasms have gone down, uh, they're totally released to do whatever they want to do. And the advantage, the main advantage of the posterior frame anatomy is you haven't fused anything. And so you, a, you don't have to tr make sure fusion occurs. But there isn't also the long-term concern of adjacent segment degeneration at the discs above and below that fused segment. I see. So the long-term risk and complications are definitely different than an anterior cervical yeah. fusion. Um, let's talk a little bit about the complications. Is there anything unique to this procedure, this posterior frame anatomy, um, that you worry about as a neurosurgeon in terms of potential complications? Anything different than the norm? With uh, uh, specifics to the posterior frame anatomy, a couple of things that are, are, are of concern. Number one, uh, the nerves can be very uh, uh, delicate, and so we have to be very careful when we're in there manipulating the nerves and taking things off. At most levels, not a problem, but again, that C5 nerve, for some reason, uh, is much more tender and sensitive than the other nerves. And every once in a while, 1% of the time, we'll notice that, for whatever reason, that nerve goes out for a few months, and the patient can't raise their arm up in the air. Thank God it's only a temporary thing and comes back, but th those are one of the concerns that we have when we operate at the C5 nerve. Uh, the other things we have to be very careful about, since this is a non-fusion surgery, you don't want to cause any injury to all the normal uh, structures there. Muscles, nerves, ligaments, but most especially the joints, the facet joints at the back of the spine has to be uh, kept pristine. Because if you um, affect that joint in any way, the person's pain and uh, stability can be affected. So you're worried about the ligaments around the joint as well as the joint itself. Correct. So you don't want to damage those ligaments and, and give that person any instability. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, this is good information. I, I think, do you have any, any comments that we haven't discussed about um, posterior frame anatomy or any advice for patients who are perhaps trying to decide whether they want to uh, consider an anterior procedure, an anterior fusion, or the, the posterior procedure. Sure. I think, again, uh, uh, patient education is the most important thing. On the Internet and also when they talk to most surgeons, they're, they're going to get recommended to do an anterior cervical discectomy fusion for two reasons. Number one is because um, it's financially rewarding. They make more money doing that. But number two is that um, many people have not been trained in doing that frame anatomy from the back. And so I think it's always important to, uh, if, if it's not explained well to you, get a second opinion or read more about it and make sure that, you know, that um, anything you potentially are a candidate for is at least fully presented and fully explained to you. Well, it would make sense. You know, if, if you spend 75% <coughs> of your time doing anterior cervical fusions, um, you're going to become much more comfortable. And, and like a lot of things, once you have a hammer that works pretty well, everything starts looking like a 10-penny nail and you figure you can hammer it. You got it. Okay. Well, thanks for coming by. Good information. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.